Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Without Jackson Fly, there is no disclaimer. So in fact, our disclaimer is that there is no disclaimer. On that infinite loop, I will introduce you to This Week in Science, coming up next. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, who starts this show? What's I going know. on? <laughs> Justin's Hi, not here. Hello, Blair. Justin's not here, and we're a little bit confused. <sighs> happy solstice. Oh, happy solstice to you. Yeah, and this isn't, you know, a new age greeting. It's actually an astronomical astronomically important date in our calendar year. <laughs> it is. It has to do with where we are in our ch- in our journey around the sun. And uh, it's time for those days to start getting shorter. But that doesn't mean that science doesn't keep happening. Right, Blair? Very, very true. What did you bring this week? I brought a bunch of stories about... Let's see, what do I have on my list? I've got... Birds not liking noise. I've got world robot domination. I've got an LHC update. And I will start it all off with space madness. What did space you bring? madness? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's my ice cream bar. <laughs> well, hopefully I didn't bring any duplicates, but I brought drones that work for endangered species, counting bears, talking plants, and ancient ancestral milkmaids. Yeah, I don't think we're overlapping, but your stories sound <laughs> really interesting. Well, that's good. I want to learn about those ancient milkmaids. Tell yes. me more about that later. First, we're going to jump into space madness because I just want to clump all these spacey stories together. And, you know, I haven't been around for a couple of weeks, so... I- I don't know if they, if you guys have been talking about science, uh, not science, space, but space stuff still happens. And uh, there's some big news this week. The Chinese are colonizing space. Well, hmm. you know, maybe it's not completely col- not colonizing. They actually sent their very first co- um, taikonauts. They're taikonauts. I was going to say cosmonauts, but that's Russia. Astronauts, United States, taikonauts um, into space and put their first crew on their space station. That's right. China has its own spacecraft, orbital spacecraft or space station. Uh, It's called Tiangong-1 Space Station, and they are the third country to be putting people on a little, in a little can orbiting our planet, which is pretty exciting. Um, It's just great to know that... uh, more cultures that cultures other than the United States, Russia are really still working to get into space. And this isn't something that's just important to the Westerners in the world. This is something that's important around the world. Space is a global, a global ideal, right? So it's pretty exciting. Other news about this, they got their first woman into space on this trip. So female Taikonaut, Chinese are about the uh, the equality of the sexes in space. That's great. Nice. Uh, so the Shenzhou spacecraft uh, resembles a Soyuz spacecraft, and it fly it flew uh, aboard Chinese Long March two F rocket, and um, and they docked with the Tiangong space station this week. It's 2.07 a.m. Eastern Time. It's just exciting news. Very exciting news. I think that um, we need, 
even in the U.S., as we are kind of dropping our federally sponsored space program and the private industry is growing and we're fostering the growth of the private industry, we do need to keep our um, eyes open and keep looking around the, uh, around the globe at what other countries like China are doing. Um you know, either to develop partnerships for going into space even further or, you know, a little healthy competition sometimes <laughs> makes things happen. Yeah, you think maybe NASA will get some more funding now because they see the Chinese now creeping up on us in the space race and they're going to have to do something about it? Who knows? Yeah, I mean, for the last couple of years, it's been, you know, China and India and Japan have been kind of elbowing in and China's just... Mm -hmm. uh, they're being very successful and it it's a, it's a whole prioritization question where do you want the funds to go and what do you want to try to do and um you know we'll see i i think that our country could benefit from a little competition again it 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 benefited us in the past right yeah well and even if you just have another place to go to uh like you were saying, partner with them since we are, have our limited funds now to be able to do those kinds of things. That'd be great. Yep. Uh, in other news, we, uh, we've we talked before about the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Well, uh, a new analysis of some of the, uh, the data from the LRO. They shot a laser at Shackleton Crater on the south pole of the moon, and it looks like there might be water, or maybe mm. not in the crater. <laughs> it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. Um, the way that the laser reflected back, they found that it was a, uh, there were many bright spots. There were many places that, um, that light, that water could be because it is a very shadowed crater, but it also does get hit by light. So, uh, it could, it, the, the water could evaporate and disappear also. Um, hmm. So they don't really know how much water is there. They just know that there is, it looks as though there might be. It's may, I love that all the news stories are maybe, it's tantalizing, but, ah, yeah. And so what's the excitement if there is water on the moon? Just remind me. <laughs> so if there's water on the moon, it makes it easier for us to to get stuff, to do things on the moon. Um, right. If like there's water, on, or set up a space station. Um, okay. Yeah, to, or a, a moon a moon station where uh, where work could be done uh, on the moon, set up industry, set up, um, uh, somebody in the chat room says maybe terraforming. Um, mm. Yeah, if there's water on the moon, it's in the form of ice crystals, but uh, it's, right. you know, water takes energy to create because you have to throw together hydrogen and oxygen uh, in the right conditions. It's not terribly difficult to do, but it does take energy to create. And so um, it would be energy intensive to have to make our own water once we got there, or as somebody else in the chat room said, to be able to bring it from earth to the moon to support humans um, or to support industry. Yeah, okay, so, so I guess my question is, because there's not the same atmospheric pressure on the moon as on Earth, there's no, they can't really have a full water cycle, right? So once you use right. it, it's gone. Right, unless you, so if it's in these ice crystals, and mostly they think in craters on the moon um, in the form of ice, ice crystals. So what you would want to do is harvest the ice crystals and then mm -hmm. be able to uh, keep that the ice, turn it to liquid water, uh, gas water, and uh, be able to uh, keep it in a closed loop system. Okay. So you, you, you'd probably lose some, but the ideal would be to get it into a closed loop system that we could then use and reuse. Right. Yeah. It's pretty, it, it, pretty interesting stuff. They're mapping out the, mapping out the moon, trying to figure out where things are, where there's water, there might be ice in Shackleton Crater. It looks promising. We'll see. Um, and then the, yeah. And then the final spacey news that I thought was really interesting this week is actually um, a simulation looking way back into our universe's 
past. So this is more cosmology than astronomy. Um, but uh, some researchers published in Nature a, a, a series of computer simulations that they've done. And these computer simulations looked at how um, dark matter and baryonic matter might have interacted to um, create the universe as it is now. And uh, what they think is that it was a little bit lumpier, so clumpier, lumpier, that dark matter and baryonic or normal matter um, were more clumped. And there's a, a pretty, an interesting picture that they've come up with, a very clumpy looking picture from the simulation. Um, the interesting thing about this is it's not just a simulation that says, this is, we, we put these numbers into a computer and then it spit out this interesting picture that suggests it might have been clumpy. The study actually goes into um, suggestions for how we might actually look for evidence of this. So here we have this model. We think the early universe looked this way. And if it did look this way, it makes sense that our universe looks the way it does now. So in a sense, explaining the evolution of dark matter um, and normal matter in our universe. Um, and it's based on sound waves, which I think is very interesting. So um, baryonic matter um, might have, uh, it, 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 it creates, let me see if I can get this right here, um, pressure on photons push electrons in the early gas, that baryonic and the baryonic and dark matter gas environment of the early universe. And then whether it was baryonic matter or dark matter or whatever the photons were running into and pushing on, it would create a, a fluctuation. And that fluctuation can be detected as a sound wave. And so we, uh, these researchers are looking at baryon acoustic oscillations. So these oscillations that are a result of the fluctuations of early matter. Um, and they're in a, a frequency wavelength that currently we don't have any telescopes that are set up to detect. Uh, they suggest that the spectral range is 50 to 100 megahertz, which we could detect it's reg normal radio electromagnetic uh, range, but we just don't have any telescopes that have uh, equipment that are set up to, to detect in that particular frequency range. So they say we need to get telescopes out there. They, uh, they suggest uh, instruments similar to the Murchison Wide Field Array, MWA in Australia, or the Low Frequency Array called LOFAR in the Netherlands. Um, but those that are that are already started aren't in the right part of the spectrum. We just need to develop an instrument that's in the right part of the spectrum to look for these oscillations that kind of hop on top of uh, the frequencies uh, of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So we just look at the light that's coming from the early universe and then look for this kind of kind of like a it's like the carrier micro the carrier sorry, the cosmic microwave background radiation is like a carrier wave, a carrier frequency for these other oscillations in the 50 to 100 megahertz range that could be detected if we had the equipment to do it. So I love the fact that it's not just simulations and kind of ex an explanation, but actually uh, giving a way that we can confirm what they've, what they've tried to do with computers. Wow, that's crazy. It's funny, I wouldn't have thought to use sound, but then when you say it, it's kind of like a well-duh moment. It it makes sense. Right. Like it's not, it's, and it's not the, oh, it's going to be like a song from a piano, um, the range of frequencies that you're listening to. It's not going to be really pretty, but the cosmic microwave background, you tune, you, once upon a time, you could tune a television to... Um, in between channels, the static, right? And that's the, that static is a lot of the, the hum of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So if you could imagine being able to take a signal from that's being carried on that, uh, that we normally haven't looked for, 
you know, maybe in our TVs, maybe in our, our TVs, that static carries this the information of how the early universe works. Wow, that's trippy. <laughs> totally trippy, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, so. speaking of sound waves. Excellent. Uh, Good segue. It's actually very fortuitous. So I want to talk about talking plants. <laughs> awesome. We have found that plants actually emit sounds to talk to each other. Crazy stuff. So we were just talking about megahertz. This is at about 200 hertz. Mm-hmm. And these plants, they were looking at corn saplings. They emit clicking sounds from their roots. Whoa. And they found that when they take these saplings and they submerge the roots in water so that it would carry the sound and they played a similar frequency sound at the roots, the roots started to grow towards the source of the sound. What? Yeah. So before we knew that recent studies, actually, we've seen mm -hmm. have proved, as far as we can tell, that plants do respond to sounds. There have always been those mm -hmm. uh, kind of elementary school science experiments where you play music to the plants and you see how they grow and all that kind of stuff. Well, and they've people, decided and they... people talk about talking to your plants or playing music yeah. to your plants to make them happy. Mm. All of this just makes me wonder about, you know, when you eat them, do they scream? But anyway. That's exactly <laughs> what I started thinking is we thought they had no communication abilities. Now, not only right. do they communicate with uh, chemicals, like cabbage emits certain chemical signals um, yeah. to other cabbage plants. Now they're also actually making sounds to talk to each other. Are we going to find out that these animals have... A nervous system and we didn't know that before what are we going to find out next that plants can do that we just kind of wrote them off but they actually have these complex systems it's just baffling to me well i think that a lot of it stems from our own um hubris you know right. the the human anthropomorphic uh you know we we're the best we're the most complex things in the universe. You know, our minds, obviously, we rule the planet, blah, 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 blah. But we disregard all sorts of things that go on in nature just because it does. we haven't noticed them. We don't know how to look at them. We haven't known to look for them. Yeah, it's the only colors that... Only the colors that we see are the colors that exist. Well, actually, there's all these other colors. Then there's mm -hmm. all these other sounds that, since we'd never heard them, we just assume they didn't exist. Right. It's and just... now, and now, plants are clicking at each other. Yeah. Plants are talking. <laughs> plants are talking, and they tell each other, hey, it's nice over here. I have lots of water. Why don't you grow this way? Yeah. Right? I mean, oh my if... Gosh. <laughs> Come over here. The water's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm in shock and awe at this. When I read it, I was just, I was amazed. And at the same time, it's another thing where you just, you just wonder, well, exactly what other things are we overlooking? And it just mm -hmm. makes me thirsty for more information about these plants that I thought were boring. <laughs> right. Well, uh, yeah, right. Boring plants, not so boring anymore. It's not just the carnivorous plants that are exciting. They're all talking about you behind your back. <laughs> yep. Yeah, somebody, uh, Rourke's in the chat room uh, said, I uh, asked um, or made the comment that uh, maybe they hear the sun. So I think that's a really interesting question. So if plants are clicking at each other, if they're picking up vibrations in some way, um, we know that photons can exert pressure. They do exert pressure. They have mass. So, uh, you know, how sensitive are plants? Are they sensitive enough to... Uh, I guess, sense the vibrations of the sun in a way that it's not hearing necessarily, but is it a, a vibrational sensitivity? Yeah, wow. That's it. <sighs> really I'm a interesting little overwhelmed question. right now. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, mind blown, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> what what more are we? yeah all right now humans puny humans <laughs> you're nothing these are talking about me behind my back i think i know you have you don't even have as a human you don't even have as many cells in your own body as there are bacteria on you you're more bacteria than you are human and you didn't even know the plants could talk. And there, there's, there's more plants on this planet. There's more biomass on this planet from plants and photosynthesizing creatures than uh, there is of humanity. What would be really interesting is to find out if there was a plant language where certain frequencies mean there's good stuff over here. Just yeah. like with the cabbage, they let out a, a gas if it's if it's something bad is going on, wonder if they're screaming over there saying, don't come over here. We're getting eaten. I know. Ah! Those, oh, now I'm just going to feel bad about the salad that is <laughs> sitting over here and not eaten yet. Oh, lettuce. Oh, carrots. I will, I will apologize to you and thank you for the n nutrition that you are giving me. <laughs> it's a part of the planetary cycle. It's, Yes. Oh dear, I love that story. Blair, wow. This is this is a big story. 200 hertz and 200 hertz is just at the outside range of human hearing. 200 hertz is just about where the human hearing range gives up the goat. Um, you know, some teenagers can maybe hear 200 hertz. <laughs> Older adults, no. Yeah. No, I'm just picturing teenagers walking around looking. Where's that clicking sound coming from? <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear I, that? What? Yeah, no, I'm actually, I'm actually thinking, I'm imagining, you know, a, a toddler like my son or a little, a little kid lying on the ground with their ear to the dirt. And what are you doing lying on the ground? Listening to the bugs. You know, maybe they really are listening to the bugs and listening to the plants talking to each other. Yeah. Goodness. Goodness gracious. Wow. If you just tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science. I'm Dr. Kiki and Blair Bezdarich, our wonderful intern, is with us tonight. Justin. I don't know where Justin is. I think he's I think he's working. I think he has a, a big he has a big car night, which is good. That's what I heard. <laughs> Go make, go make that money, Justin. Um, along the uh, the sound lines, I have a story uh, about n birds and how noisy environments affect birds, and so especially songbirds. And so this study, published in Biology Letters, is uh, from a Duke biologist and uh, and co-author uh, Steve Nowicki. And I've actually. I'm connected to Steve Nowicki somewhere along the line of the of the the bird people I've worked with in my career, but um, I probably have met him too. I cannot remember. But interesting, he works on songbirds and song learning, and um, he's got a lab where they take they they took male swamp sparrows and, as babies, put them in the laboratory so they could isolate them from all outside stimulation, so that. Uh, they can control the environment and give the birds the kinds of songs that they want to test their responses to. And so in this particular situation, they played eight songs to the birds that were noisy. So they were recorded from male song sparrows in the in the wild, but from like 25 feet away. So there's all sorts of other noise uh, from the environment that's kind of getting in the way of that song. And then they also played eight songs that were very clear, that had been recorded from right near the bird. There's no distortion, just clear song. Um, and, and then look to see which songs got passed down, which songs were learned by those birds in their little isolation chambers. Which ones did they de decide were the songs they wanted to learn? If you had a choice between kind of learning to talk from somebody um, over a garbled telephone line or learning to talk from somebody who is right next to you teaching you to talk, who are you going to talk 
more like? What do you think, Blair? The thing where you hear syllables more clearly. Exactly. Enunciate. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly right. The birds, um, the birds chose preferentially they learned the songs that were easier to hear and so what this implies is that there is uh, an impact of noise pollution in the environment on the uh, on the learning of songs and um, how and how songs are passed down from generation to generation in populations of birds and so this Potential. What they're talking about in this study, particularly, is how human noise uh, could affect populations of birds and be really changing which songs from which individuals actually make it into the next generation. So our our noise is probably affecting the um, the passage of language from bird to bird to bird. So. Urbanized areas are making inarticulate birds with perhaps a funny accent. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. Yeah, with probably a very funny accent. Yeah, they can't talk to the country birds. City birds, <gasps> they just don't know how to talk to country birds. <laughs> well, that's interesting, though. If, if the noise pollution would make different factions of bird language, like dialects almost, because of what they're able to be exposed to in different areas. I don't know. Or ones that are easier to learn over others that are harder because they can't hear as well. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, you know, a, a baby bird when it's learning, you know, and it's first starting to pick up song is just in the nest. You know, it's sitting in the nest. It's not moving around very much. It's just soaking it all in. And so uh, it, the plastic period when the birds start jumping around and they're old and they're juveniles and they're able to get around and do stuff. The plastic period uh, of the song learning, it, they're still soaking in information from the environment, but there's a, a period of time when they're very influenced um, by what is close to them because they can't move around to choose something that's a clearer signal. Yeah, so well, it all makes yeah. sense. I mean, pollution is in the name. We know it's not going to have a positive impact. <laughs> so, I'm not yeah. that surprised. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Birds don't like it. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. It would make sense because it's such a uh, sound-based communication in their species, and they are social groups, especially sparrows. So, I mean, being able to hear one another is going to be very important not only for just basic communication, but learning how to communicate. So yeah, um, let's move. Let's move on. You got you've you've got Blair's Animal Corner to get to. We've already got some animal stuff going on, but this is your animal Blair's Animal Corner with so Blair. I, yay! <laughs> I had to bring up the counting bears because <laughs> this was just really interesting to me. Um, they've found counting abilities in primates before, but never in any other type of animal. So they looked at bears because I guess they have just huge brains related to body size. And so bears are known to be smarter anyway, but they haven't really done a lot of psychological tests with these guys. And they did the very first ever touch screen test with a mm. large carnivore. So imagine a bear with their giant claws touching a tux touch screen for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> Which just shows you that bears can be dainty if they want to be. <laughs> exactly. Bears <laughs> like just honey. Crush the touch screen the minute they touch it. <laughs> so admittedly, this is a pretty small test group. It was three black bears because they had to train these bears to begin with, which was, I'm sure, an arduous, very time-consuming task. They trained two of the bears when showed on a screen uh, two different clusters of dots. They they. They trained two of the bears to pick the smaller cluster of dots, the less in number, and they trained one bear to pick the greater number of dots. And they would get a treat if they picked the right one. And so after all this training and they, they realized or they were satisfied that the bears knew what they were supposed to be selecting for, they would show on this touch screen <clears throat> two different clusters of dots of different number, 
But what they did to try to make sure that they weren't just picking the bigger thing was they changed the size of the dots and the area that the dots were in. So that varied. So in the end, they were convinced that these bears were picking the number of dots. So they were essentially what we would call counting. It's not exactly like they're going one, two, three, one, four, two, five. three, right? But they can quantify a number of things in relation to another number of things. And they That's- even they even compared their data set with a data set from primates that they were convinced could count, and they hmm. matched up pretty well. That's really that's so. really interesting. I love the fact that the, I mean, it's it's probably not counting in the way that we think of counting. It's probably counting in the sense of um, people and other primates are able to pretty well. Not we don't really know other primates, but people are um, able to very accurately be able to judge the number of a small number of objects. So I don't remember the the limit to it, but it's something under 10, that if like three or four things grouped together you, without even really thinking about it and having to count it out, you can go, mm-hmm. oh, that's three, that's four. So we have some kind of an innate ability to recognize groups of right. objects mm-hmm. and, to be, and to compare those, those sizes. And so I think it's interesting that it, uh, in the bear's, it shows that there's some kind of convergent behavioral process going on. Well, and if you think about it, this is a big animal that has a lot of body mass that it has to support. And these animals are mostly scavengers. They do catch some fish. They catch a few small prey animals on land, but a lot of what they eat is just what they find. And so it would be advantageous to be able to look, for example, at two bushes, see one that had you know, five berries on it and one that had 20 berries on it and no to go to that bush with more berries on it. It would just, right. when you're a foraging species and also when you're a sedentary species and a um, sol- or solitary, excuse me, solitary species, yeah. these guys don't live in very big groups. They're usually on their own. It, when you have to fend for yourself, it, it, would be, it would be advantageous to be able to quantify things. I see three bears, yeah. I see, yeah. I see three bears. Yeah. 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 <laughs> also, there's nope, three bears nope. in that valley and one bear in this valley. I'm going to go into the valley with one bear because I'll right. get more food over there. Right. Or wolves, which are other predators mm-hmm. in similar territory that bears tend to inhabit. And yet wolves hunt in packs and can be quite a, a problem for bears, I would imagine. So, yeah, but so yeah. this is just the first of most likely many um, intelligence tests to come with bears because there's all these kinds of uh, cognitive tests and intelligence tests that they can do with primates based on touchscreen technology. And now that they have successfully done that with these bears, that opens a whole new world of testing that they can do and research that they can do, which is super exciting. Yeah, to actually look into the extent of uh, of bear intelligence uh, and com- and be able to compare it in an analogous way to yeah, other species. Yeah, and if species. they can see yeah. the way that these bears use the touch screens, maybe they can find a way to develop one for animals that might be a little less dainty with a touch screen and still be able to test them out with it too. Like a hippo? <laughs> yeah, or <laughs> thinking more like a tiger maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that would be hard. You'd have to have a very big touch screen. That's right. <laughs> big, big touch screen. <sighs> On that note, I think it's time for us to take a half hour break. We have finished the first half of the show, gotten through some really interesting stories. We have a lot more to come. Stay tuned. There's more this week in science after the break. Oh 
would like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Science. Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks with over 75,000, more like over 100,000 different titles in their library, you know, and the longer they're around and as a leading provider, they're probably going to be around for a long time. Those numbers are just going to go up. They're amassing more and more books and all sorts of genres, and I'm positive that you will find something entertaining to listen to in their library. Twist has found all sorts of science-based books on audible.com, and you probably can too. And Audible will give you a free trial today. You'll get a free audiobook download, any book of your choice, and all you have to do is sign up. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. That's right, audiblepodcast.com slash twist for your free audiobook download right now. Twist also has merchandise that you might enjoy. We have CDs and t-shirts. Head over to twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G. Purchase our 2010 Science Music Compilation CD and or a World Robot Domination t-shirt. We have lots of t-shirts Lots of CDs, and I know that you'll enjoy one or enjoy giving one as a gift. That works, too. And Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, and fun things that we try to do for the show. We appreciate any amount, $2 to 200 to 2000 whatever you're able to give, you really do make this show possible. We accept donations through PayPal and have made the process easy by putting donation buttons on each show page on our website, twist.org. So go to that website, listen to the most recent episode, comment on the show, and click one of those pink buttons make a donation we thank you for your support we really couldn't do this without you Shimmy, shimmy, shimmy back into the second half. This is This Week in Science. Everyone, thank you for listening to our show. And uh, there's so much more to come. <gasps> LHC update. You want to hear about the Large Hadron Collider? Yes, please. Wanna hear? I, I know you want to hear. I know you want to hear. Have they found anything? Did they find anything? <laughs> Well, since you're talking news. about it. <laughs> the news, the news is tantalizing, to say the least, but we don't know for sure. So here's what's going on. At this point this year, the LHC has surpassed last year's total data output. So the amount of data that came out of the LHC all of last year has now already been surpassed. We're halfway through the year and we've already got more. Not all of that data has been analyzed either. So here is where things get interesting. Lots of lots of data. What's going on with that data? Well, there are rumors. Rumors aplenty. Peter Voigt on his blog, Not Even Wrong, he wrote... The bottom line is now clear. There's something there which looks like a Higgs is supposed to look. Hmm. What does that mean? Okay, last year, the end of the year, December-ish, there was a press conference. Uh, Researchers came out, physicists came out, and they said, we have a three sigma result at around 125 giga electron volts. Um, And three sigma isn't quite enough to say, yeah, that's it. It is what, it's strong enough to say, well, there's evidence. I mean, when you're doing statistics and you're looking for a P value, um, you want, in most science, you want something that's within the 0.05% error range. So you, or 0.05 error range. You want just a very small percent of the time for 
things not to be right. So if when you get a signal that it's not the right signal, you want the majority of the evidence to suggest that it's right. Um, so three sigma, not very strong evidence, but now with all the data they've got, and this is with the data they've analyzed. And like I said, there's all this data they still haven't analyzed. So the signal could get stronger even yet from this. It suggests, the latest rumors are suggesting, uh, and there's this article on wired.com, uh, suggests that there are a couple of experiments, so two experiments that are looking for evidence of the HIG. Um, the, uh, I think it's the ATLAS experiment and what's the other one, the CMS experiment. Um, anyway, they separately are looking for evidence of the HIGs and possibly have about four sigma result, which is slightly more significant. Six sigma is what we really want for a really significant, nice result to go, yeah, that's the Higgs. Each getting experiment, there. getting there, right? Each experiment, rumors have it that they're at about four sigma. You take those separate experiments and put their data together because they're separate experiments. They're not replicating themselves, which means that putting them together makes them both stronger. So you put them together, the, the, the it's suggested that they might be at about five sigma. Hmm. Suggested that they might be really getting a strong, strong result for the uh, Higgs boson. Still not, you know, this is rumors. It's a rumor mill. Right. So we don't know. Um, people think uh, that an announcement is going to take place in the at the International Conference on High Energy Physics in Melbourne, Australia, sometime between July 4th and July 11th. So beginning of July, we might have some really interesting news. Are we going to have a party if we find the Higgs boson? Woo! <laughs> boson party! Boson party! Yeah! Boson Yay. party! Yeah, that's right. That's right. Shuffle, 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 shuffle. <laughs> that will be a day that will be a celebration forever. I, I think so. I mean, really, it's... Um, it's... If... If they find it, it's the last piece of the of the standard model that has not been confirmed yet, and I mean that's a it's it's gonna be a big day for for scientists when that gets announced. So um, yeah, Very uh, yeah. Someone in the chat room saying, um, "What is the Higgs boson benefit to humanity?" Well, you know, gives everything mass. It's kind of the. <laughs> <laughs> the it's just the God. one of the ma the mass giving particle to um, all of matter, basically, right? <laughs> yeah, kind of important yeah. <laughs> as far as as far as models go. Uh, Web three two three two says particles that are a myth. Yeah, I don't, mm. Mm. I don't know, but it's it's exciting. All rumors, but. You know, isn't this what, you know, so many um, tabloids are based on? I mean, this is the kind of stuff that, that sells newspapers. They're really, right. you know, people it's, eat rumors up, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. The front of the Inquirer, Higgs boson, question mark? What? <laughs> <laughs> he was found drinking in the closet yep. of, no. <laughs> Higgs boson, half bat, half man. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. That 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 headline will probably come out. <laughs> what were you going to say? <laughs> you had, you, oh, you had something it's, it's so neat it. that we might have the data already. We just haven't gotten to it yet. That's super right. exciting to me. It's like a wrapped present just waiting to be opened. Mm, yeah. Data. <laughs> I know. And it's just, you know, thinking about the massive amounts of numbers, data that's being, you know, physicists, statisticians, they're, they're crunching these numbers and they're just looking at it and hoping they can get through it before the end of the year. Will they get through it before the end of the year in order to uh, give us a Higgs before Christmas? Oh, be a good Christmas present. Yeah. <laughs> All I want for Christmas is a Higgs boson, a Higgs boson. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You should record that. Next CD. 
Oh, I think I just did record it. That's that's the whole song. Oh. <laughs> we can write some more lyrics on that. We could get it done. Yeah, we probably could do that. All right, tell me a story. What do you have okay. up next? This is exciting. I have a story about drones that would reduce poaching in Nepal. Conservationists in Nepal have designed this drone. They just they just did a um, test flight of two of them. They're about uh, two meters in their wingspan. They can go 25 kilometers away from the remote control station and they can stay up in the air for up to 45 minutes. They can fly up to 200 meters in the air. So that's a pretty good uh, range from the control station and these guys are completely unmanned and they're fitted with gps and a camera and right now they're just using them and they're planning on using them to kind of survey the areas where their most endangered species are hanging out so that they can reduce poaching and so the two big species that they're looking at right now are greater one-horned rhinos, also known as Indian rhinos, also known as Asian rhinos, and uh, some of their tiger species that are native to the area of northern India. Um, it's funny because uh, the rhino I take care of at work is an Asian rhino. And so I found this very interesting because he is just a sweetheart. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so I'm very partial to the species naturally. And so they have these little uh, flying robots watching over these species trying to reduce poaching. My question is, do the poachers know what they look like? <laughs> because you would think that, you know, the idea of um, the radar that aren't manned on highways are that you can put the sign up and you can say, hey, the radar guns are here and it makes everyone slow down because they don't want to get caught. Well, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be helpful if the poachers somehow knew that these drones were moving around? Wouldn't that reduce the poaching before they even had to catch these people? Right. It's the threat of being caught. Right. So I feel right? like they need to have a massive, uh, I don't know, pamphlet campaign or something <laughs> where they tell people about these drones on the watch so they know people are watching over these species and they're less likely to be poached. Yeah, so uh, are they doing some kind of a camp? camp? Do you know if they're doing anything they, like that? They or haven't is it done just... anything yet because they just did their... Um, test flights. Their test flights this month. Yeah. And then they're, I think they're going to start mass producing them now is the hope that WWF is going to do that. And um, so I was joking around before when I was writing the show notes, isn't the next step to fit these guys with some sort of weapon so that they are a speaker so they can say <laughs> we see you please move away from the rhinoceros we know who you are and we will yeah. follow you by air that's right <laughs> so for those of you who don't know just a little bit of background um it might seem silly that these people are hunting down these rhinos and the tigers but they are given a lot of money for the products from these animals the rhinos specifically lots of cultures believe that rhino horn has medicinal or magical powers so they'll grind it up and put it in tea or in a pill and it's supposed to either make you more virile or yep. um, heal you yep. from some ailment and in reality like it's just made out of keratin which is the exact same stuff as fingernail so Right. Essentially, you're putting fingernail shavings into tea. So that's not very helpful when you look at the science. Yeah. And then, of course, the, the tigers, they're taking um, fur, skin, and they're actually uh, taking meat and bones from the tigers as well, which I, I think they I think are tiger also. tiger gallbladder is supposed to do something. Like the, gall, the, yeah. the gallbladder, this one little tiny organ in this massive, beautiful animal. And, you know... It, it brings yeah. a high price on the black market, which is very unfortunate for the animal. Right. And the bummer is that we can do all, all of these efforts to reduce poaching and we can do our best to stop it. But really, the only way you're going to protect these species is to stop people from buying it. That's really the only yeah. way to do it. Because as long as there is $10,000 to be made from one small piece of rhino horn, people are going to keep trying to get to it. It's going to be like winning the lottery to kill one rhino. It's going to set you up for the rest of your life, especially if you're living in these 
third world countries, some of them, where you could work in a factory for 12 cents an hour or you could kill a rhino and be set for life. These yeah. people making what for them is going to be the logical decision. So really, until you cut off the de the demand for it, it's going to be really hard for us to effectively stop poaching. It's really interesting. I mean, it's, the, it's a practice that we have that stems from... Uh, economics, um, mm -hmm. economics affecting behavioral economics, and then um, that affecting entire populations of animals, affecting ecosystems and the environment. And so just a really interesting cascade of, uh, of economic decisions. Right, exactly. That end up, end up changing uh, the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm sure these drones are going to be helpful and I'm super excited for it. I yeah. mean, it's great to have people out there doing that because we can't have, well, we can have the robots out there doing it. We just don't physically have enough people to patrol all of these animals, not to mention the fact that animals don't want to be where people are. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, this is, I see it as more of a band-aid as opposed to a solution. But all yeah, the best I, of them anyway. I think I think it's I think it's a great idea, especially I mean the UAV, the unmanned aerial vehicle. I mean, it, I would rather have um, groups like the World Wildlife Foundation, WWF. People in the chat room, we're not talking about the World Wrestling Foundation. Yeah, that's right. World Wildlife <laughs> Federation, um, and, and groups like groups like that using it to help the environment, to help animals, as opposed to, you know, the police uh, patrolling Los Angeles you know, with, with their drones. I mean, you can use them for various, various functions. I think that the, the idea behind them is the same. It's the threat of them more than the actuality of them being there. Yeah. So. I would love to hope that poaching will become a thing of the past in the future. That'd be great. You're not um, alone there. Yeah, it's just I, I think oh. I think you're right though that a multi-pronged approach is going to be the only way to stop it in short time because you can educate as many people as you want now not to buy things, but it's going to take many years for that to actually affect the market in the right way. So, in the end, if we can do this and we can try to stop people from buying it as well, then maybe we can help bring a solution to light. I guess we can hope there's always yeah. hope, right? The, the last thing left in Pandora's box, yeah. <laughs> but you know, there is no hope when it comes to world robot domination. We will be oh. ruled by the robots. <laughs> there's no hope. And especially now that, uh, the robots are getting seriously touchy feely. It's, a fascinating uh, new development by uh, uh, engineers at Southern California's Viterbi School of Engineering. They've published in Frontiers in Neuroscience, uh, Neurobiotics, sorry, uh, and they have designed a, a sensor. They call it the Biotech Sensor, uh, and it has a flexible skin or a little, you know, it's like a polymer, plastic polymer that's flexible uh, that it encases a liquid filling in which there are lots of sensors embedded. So there are sensors in the skin, in, in that polymer skin, um, and within the liquid. And so this tactile sensor, it's supposed to mimic the human fingertip. And so in the human fingertip, we have a number of different nerve endings. And there are different, there are nerve endings of different, different types um, that that detect different sensations. So pressure versus vibration versus pain, ouch. Um, you have these nerve endings that, that can help you detect all these things. So how do you build a sensor to mimic all the information that's gathered in the skin of your fingertip? Um, they created an algorithm to, uh, that allowed this sensor to make decisions or a robot, the, not the sensor, the robot to be able to make decisions on how to explore the outside world, basically by copying people. So this whole like bioengineering, biomimicry strategy that robotics is on right now, it's just, you know, copy humans, but make it better. 
<laughs> Where it's do you? It's a dangerous game. It's a da- very dangerous game. Um, so the sensor can tell where and in which direction forces are applied to the fingertip and thermal properties of an object being touched. So very much, um, very much like a fingertip. Um, this it's just fascinating the way that they've that they've put this put this um, that they've put this sensor together. Uh, so the robot was trained on a bunch of materials gathered from fabric stationery, hardware stores. Uh, they would give the robot the materials to identify, say, okay, touch the material. Can the robot identify what it is? The robot identified the material correctly 95% of the time. Hmm. 95% of the time was able to correctly do that. And it's actually um, right on par and possibly better than what uh, humans could do. According to this press release, it was only rarely confused by pairs of similar textures that human subjects making their own movements could not distinguish at all. How did the robot indicate what it sensed? Um, I, that I don't know. I'm going to guess that the, the robot wasn't talking. Right. <laughs> probably probably a, an answer on a, a computer panel. Right, or, or something readout. of that, a readout yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, but I, I haven't seen the robot, so, so I don't know. But it's uh, yeah, using I this. See, looking at the picture, I want to see what the whole robot looks like. But it's yeah. just the little finger. The, the the finger is the interesting part of this robot. Yeah. The thing that the biotax sensor that they developed, along with the uh, the algorithm for learning and exploring the environment, along with. Um, the, uh, I guess, an algorithm on top of that to uh, allow the behavior of detecting and figuring out what has been detected. Um, just, right. yeah, yeah. So I guess the next step of this, right, is to figure out if we can make prosthetics yes. that you could then wire into your own nervous system from these little fake fingers so you could have a fully functioning, feeling, robotic hand. (laughs) Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, You know, could you, because these sensors are more more sensitive uh, than a human fingertip and a robot's able to differentiate more textures, could... um, could it be wired into the human nervous system giving more input than the human nervous system is used to? But because we have such a plastic brain, would we then be upgraded? Mm. You know, is that, is that a way to um, upgrade our biology? Right. Turn this kind of technology maybe into a glove that you can right. wear and... <laughs> oh, that things. would be cool yeah wow that Just, would i know recently room at the exploratorium that much more interesting yeah that's so cool <laughs> i know recently they they had found that they could have um animals control prosthetic limbs so uh mm-hmm. with their brain just with their brain so that they you know, you have signals going in that direction from the brain to the prosthetic, but you'd have to figure out a way to send it back in the other direction, which I guess we haven't done yet, right? Yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah, no. anything is possible. <laughs> in science. 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 Anything's possible. It's so awesome. Do you have any more stories? Do you want to... Uh, I, I have one more if we have time more. about yeah, the... Yeah. Uh, Ancient milkmaids. <laughs> they found pottery in Saharan Africa that had they what they did is they looked at the fatty acids on this pottery and they found dairy fats, which they have never found oh. in Africa in prehistoric samples before. So, yeah. and they dated this all the way back to the fifth millennium BC. So this is 7,000 years ago. And it's, 
it's shocking to them, beca- uh, the people that found it, because they've only ever found pottery with dairy fats on them in Europe before. They haven't found them in Africa. So and not so, only and the, is, and the dating of it, it's old. Right. It much can, older than they thought. And so it's not only just throwing into question when they thought we were drinking milk, but it's also now they're going to have to take a closer look at when we develop the enzyme that processes lactose because they had placed that way later in history. And now they're going to have to scale that back. And oh, that's it's also, interesting. It's affecting how, like before they were, so before they were looking at um, cow bones and cattle bones in those areas to try to figure out if they were using them as dairy cows or not, but they have never found enough bones to be able to figure out what kind of cattle they were holding there. And so now this is, this is really interesting to them because they've been trying to figure this out from the bones, but now they found this pot that was unglazed. So it had absorbed the fatty acids and they were able to find these dairy fats. That's really, really interesting. And it's such a, it's a big step because it's like you said, it it gives a new question to uh, the evolution of our ability to, to handle dairy. It puts into question when uh, modern agriculture, modern ranching took place. When were we actually working with cattle and keeping them close at hand to actually milk them? Right. You know, and if we're, and if we were, uh, if we were working with cattle at that point, uh, that early in time, what other things are we doing that we, you know, haven't really dated then yet? You know, what other agricultural practices did we have? How did, how would it have affected the cultural, the culture at that point right. in time? Yeah, definitely. And that also means that they already had these skills when they started to move out of Africa into other areas, which also mm-hmm. totally changes a lot a lot of what they were uh, thinking about archaeologically and anthropologically in the different areas that they were studying these people in, like in Europe, where they had found this stuff before. They assumed that they developed the ab- ability, ability to hold dairy cows and um, and milk them and process milk and all of that in Europe. But now they've realized that it's it had a completely different origin and they took it with them, which changes what they were thinking about the society there at the time and all of those things. That's really cool. Very cool. Ancient milkmaids, old yeah. cows. Just changes the way that we look at ourselves. Yeah. All from All from a bunch of fat on the inside of a broken pottery remain i know it's the little things little proteins can tell you a lot that's right absolutely um so can a lot of stuff that ends up in sediments at the bottom of lakes we've got 550 foot deep lake in russia that has a very hard name to say and i think that's the best reason for even mentioning this story it's a russian lake um (laughs) It's a Russian lake that a lot of researchers call Lake E. And the lake fills an impact crater that formed 3.6 million years ago. Um, It's called Lake El Gigatigin. (laughs) Gigatigin. Gigatigin. El Gigatigin. That's what we want to call it. I just want to say that over and over again. El Gigatigin. Um, uh, they've collected a sediment core going back to look at uh, at his- history of uh, of our climate that will take us very far far into our past. And so, um, there's some inf- interesting information that will that is coming out of it, and um, will tell us a lot that uh, we don't already have from a different, you know, different area of, uh, of the planet. So it's not Arctic. It's not Antarctic. It's someplace else. So we are done with the show. We've done this for an hour plus some, I do believe. And um, already, already Blair has more stories that are lined up there, but you know, we got to wrap it up. So um, on next week's show, maybe we'll find all three of us (laughs) in in, in cahoots to bring you the science. Uh, we will see how that works out. I know I will be back. I will be back next week. I will not be traveling. I will be 
in San Francisco. So you're going to be in San, San Francisco, Blair? I think so. Reunited and it feels so good. <laughs> so good. <No>. Uh-uh. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right, everyone. Shout outs to all of you who have posted on our website, who have posted on the social networks, um, who are just po- pouring in your support of This Week in Science. Uh, we are you know, into an interesting period right now, and we'll we'll keep you updated on what's going on for sure. We appreciate all of your support. Like we, like I say, every show we really couldn't do it without you. So Blair, you want to take Justin's role for the end of this? Yeah, thank you everyone for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just search for This Week in Science on iTunes, or if you have an Android device, you can look for the Twist for Droid app in the Android marketplace. And don't we have an iPhone app as well now? We have an iPhone app. Look for Twist. Yeah. Yep, Twist. That's right. And for more information on anything you've heard here today, tonight, on the solstice, uh, show notes are going to be available. I guess we're a day past the solstice. Whatever. Close enough. We'll be available on our website, twist.org. We also want to hear from you. So you can send us an email, justin at thisweekinscience.com or kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Be sure to put twists in the subject line so it doesn't get spam filtered into oblivion, as Justin always says. That's right. You can also contact us on Twitter, at Dr. Kiki or at Jackson Fly, and I am at Blair's Menagerie. We love your (laughs) feedback. If there's any topic you'd like us to cover or address or a suggestion for an interview, anything at all, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week bringing you more great science-y goodness. And if you've learned anything at all from the show today, remember, it's all in your head. (laughs) This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a dime May rid the world of toxoplasma, got me aye, Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. Laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything that we've said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in 
This week in science. 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 This week in science.